Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angler's Biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video, we are going to be doing an introduction to the respiratory system. And in this video, we are going to cover the various structures and their functions and annotate them, as well as looking at the various ways in which your respiratory system is suited for gaseous exchange. Please know, though, that other videos are going to do more detail about the processes like gaseous exchange in more detail. So if you want to find those, you can see them now linked above, or you can go and check out the grade 11 playlist. Now, if you are new here, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and make sure you are subscribed because I post every Tuesday and Thursday for grades 10 to 12 life sciences. So let's begin our journey with the nose. Now, what you can see in front of you here is a cross section through the side of a human's skull and face. And that is where we see our nose over here. So this is the opening to our nose, these are the nostrils. And that is where air is going to enter into your respiratory system. Now, it is better to breathe through your nose, and this is why. Ultimately, when air moves through the nose, it has to bypass a few um, obstacles, um, as well as moving through the sinuses. Um, and the reason why this is a good thing um, to breathe through your nose rather than through your mouth is because there are a few things in there that are going to stop infections and also we want to warm the air. So the first thing that's inside your nose is hairs. Now I know that a nose hair doesn't feel like it's got a job, but it does. Ultimately, nose hairs are there to trap any foreign particles from moving deeper into your nasal passage. Um, they are also there so that if mucus collects on it, they have something to attach to so that when a particle like a virus or a bacteria moves through your a nasal passage, it gets stuck on the hairs and the mucus on the hairs um, and then doesn't go any further, which of course then brings me to the other thing that we often find inside of our nose, which is mucus. Now, to remind you, mucus is just like a, a secretion a little bit of water, a little bit of protein um, that you secrete, and its main function is to trap dust viral and bacterial particles, fungal spores too, because ultimately once it is inside your body, you then have to rely on your second and third line of defense in your immune system, which requires a lot more effort and specialization. So we want to stop that first. The third thing um, why it's important to breathe through your nose, I just mentioned to you now, is that when you breathe through your, your nose, it has a warming effect on the air. Um, and now this is important because remember, we want to keep the body a nice 37 degrees. And the only way to do that is to warm the air when it enters. Um, and so that's why it's better to breathe through your nose than through your mouth. Now, once the air has moved through your nose or nasal passages, it's going to go down the back of your throat and it's going to make its way down to the trachea. Now, of course, you can also breathe through your mouth, which is actually just located here below your teeth, and that can also enter into the back of your throat where you can breathe if your nose is blocked. Before I move on, grade 11s, I also want to remind you that I have my grade 11 cheat sheet study guide, and you can get your hands on that at my website, which is missangler.co.za. It makes studying so easy, so simple. It's not like a textbook. It truly is a cheat sheet to studying. I've summarized everything. I've left out everything that you don't need to know, everything that's not important, and it just makes your life so much easier. And you can find that once again on my website, missangler.co.za. Now that the air is making its way down to your lungs, it's going to go past various structures, starting off with the larynx, which is this structure we see up over here. Now, we often get the larynx and the pharynx confused. The easiest way to tell the difference between the two is that the larynx, I like to think of as language, like the two letter L's, um, because that is where you speak from. That is where your vocal cords are located. It's where what you would call your Adam's apple is. And so I like to think of larynx is for language speaking, and the pharynx is for food. That is the other passageway where food will go back the, down the back of your throat and into the esophagus. But I'm not going to mention too much of the pharynx because it's more associated with our digestive system. 
Now, as air passes past the larynx, it's going to move down into this tube here, and this is called the trachea. Now, the trachea is held open by cartilaginous rings, and these cartilaginous rings give support and structure to the trachea so that your passageway stays open and so that you can breathe. Now, the trachea is also lined in mucus as well, and that is, again, to trap any foreign particles from making their way down into the trachea. Now, this mucus um, originates some of it in your nose, but also the glands or the little globular cells. Uh, we call them goblet cells. You may remember them. They are the ones that can secrete mucus. And it's also just there for a little bit of lubrication as well. It makes it easy to move around any particles. Now, moving on to the bigger structures, as our air moves down our trachea, it's going to branch off either to the left or to the right. Now, I'm going to get to those names shortly because we're going to zoom in closer so you can see them. Let's do the bigger stuff first. First of all, the most obvious thing that we can see here is the lungs. Now, you have uh, two lungs, as you can see here. You have a left and a right lung. And the lungs themselves are actually slightly different sizes, and they have different amounts of lobes. You will notice the lung on the right of the body. And yes, that is the right side of the body, because remember, it's the opposite in a person than your, your hand. So it's not your right, it's the person's right. They have three lobes, one, two, three, versus the left lung only has two. And the lobes that I'm referring to are these little sections that you can see here. And I want you to think of a lobe as being like a region or an area. And the reason why the left one is a little bit smaller is because we've got to put the heart in this space over here. Now, another structure that we see in this diagram is the diaphragm. And it's obviously very, very, very closely related to the breathing mechanism because remember the diaphragm is that muscle that moves up and down and it allows you to breathe. Now, protecting the lungs, there are two things we need to be aware of. First of all, it is this faint sort of pink line that we can see on the outside here. And that is called the pleura or the pleura membrane. And the pleura or the pleural membrane secretes a fluid. And that fluid is to prevent friction. And as we know, um, the lungs are moving every single day. And so we don't want to um, have too much friction and, and literally burn or um, waste away, deteriorate the lung tissue. So we've got to put them in these like little skin-like bags and we fill it with a little bit of fluid so that there's a little bit of lubrication and so that there's no friction. Now, the last thing I need to mention in terms of protecting our thoracic cavity and our lungs is going to be a combination of two things, which are these bones as well as the muscles that sit in between them. You may remember these as the ribs and the intercostals. Now, the ribs and intercostal muscles are there for protection, but they're also really important breathing structures because they are the ones that initiate making the thoracic cavity bigger so that you can start pulling in air and breathing. Now, as I did mention earlier in the video, I wanted to zoom in a little bit closer on the the branches of the trachea as they get smaller. And so what we've done is we have removed the um, lungs and everything else so you can just see the trachea and the tubes that come out of the trachea. So here, yet again, is the trachea, and the air is now moving down. Now, the air is going to branch off to the left, and it's going to branch off to the right. And these two bigger branches, they are referred to as the bronchus or the bronchi, just depends on whether you're talking about one or two, and they are right at the end of the trachea. They've got a little bit of cartilage left on them, not too much. Most importantly, they are lined with ciliated cells. Now, if you've forgotten what ciliated cells are, those are the cells that have teeny tiny little hairs on the ends of them. So if that's the cell, they've got these little hairs that stick off of them. Again, as the same function that the actual hairs in your nose have, these little cilia hairs are there to trap dust, mucus, and particles, just to make sure that you know any foreign um, substances, um, 
spores, viruses, bacteria, they don't go deeper and deeper into your lungs. Now, these little bronchies, they get smaller into these very fine little branches that you can see here. And so that's all the directions that air can take. Those small little branches, those are called the bronchioles. Now, the bronchioles are very, very small. Um, and they don't have uh, very thick walls, so they're very thin. And um, they have very uh, little or less cartilage. They basically get less and less around them uh, the deeper that we go. And it makes sense because um, the cartilage would get in the way of gaseous exchange. Now, again, we need to zoom in even further because sitting at the ends of the bronchioles, which means sitting at the end of each one of these which is where I'm drawing these black circles, should be our gaseous exchange surface or the alveoli, but we need to get even closer. So now that we have zoomed in even closer, we can finally see the very end of the bronchioles. So air is moving down this little bronchiole and it branches off into each of these alveoli. And so what we are looking at here is an alveolus or an alveoli, it just depends if you're talking about one or many. And this is where gaseous exchange occurs. Now I have a different video for you to go and watch if you want to learn more about gaseous exchange. I have linked it up above now. And it's important to know why the alveoli are structured the way they are, as well as why the, the respiratory system is structured the way it is. So the most important conversation we must have is what are the requirements for gaseous exchange to happen inside the alveoli? Now, you'll notice the alveoli are like clusters of circles. And those little clusters of circles, you can see we've cut them open here so we can see on the inside. This fulfills one of the main requirements for gaseous exchange, which is there must be a large surface area. So that's really important when it comes to gaseous exchange. We need a big surface area. So the alveoli do that really well. The next thing that we need when it comes to good gaseous exchange is it needs to be a thin surface. Now, I don't know if you know this, but alveoli are one cell layer thick, okay? They are very, very thin and very, very small, which basically means alveoli are basically microscopic if they are that thin. And they need to be thin for efficient diffusion because the more cells the slower diffusion occurs. So by making them only one cell layer thick, it means that if this is the layers of cells that make up the alveoli and this is the bloodstream moving past it, then the gas just has to simply move through only one layer to get into your bloodstream. Now, the next requirement that alveoli fulfill out of the requirements for gaseous exchange is that they have a moisture layer. And um, it's a little bit omitted or missing in this picture. But essentially what that means is, is there is a, a thin layer of moisture sitting on the inside of these alveoli over here. Um, and that is really important. It's not a lot that you would be drowning but it is definitely just enough so that gaseous exchange can occur. So there is moisture inside of your alveoli. The next thing that your alveoli have, which is another requirement of gaseous exchange, is they are able to transport gases really well. Now, what's missing on this picture, but I want you to imagine that it is there, is a capillary network. And this capillary network runs all on the outside of each of these alveoli and that allows for efficient gaseous exchange to occur because it allows for carbon dioxide to leave the blood and oxygen to enter the blood. Now the next two things that are required for gaseous exchange are a little bit abstract because we can't see them directly in this image but in order for gaseous exchange to occur properly we need something called adequate ventilation which basically means you need a mechanism to help you breathe and we do have adequate ventilation because that is what is used by the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm they are the ones that allow you to 
ventilate to bring air in and out. So we do have that. And the last requirement for gaseous exchange is you need adequate protection. Again, this is not really shown so much in this image, but the protection comes from your cartilage, from the pleura membrane and the pleural fluid around your lungs, as well as the um, ribs. So we have these six things that we need to know. And I just want to stress how important it is to know all six for your exams because they often ask you, like, name more three ways um, the alveoli is structured for gaseous exchange. And you've got to use uh, three from this list that are appropriate. Um, I wouldn't say that the last two would match up with the alveoli. They match up with the respiratory system as a whole. But definitely the first four could be the answers that you give. And please also remember, they often ask you to name and explain. So what that means is you can't just say large surface area. You must say large surface area and then elaborate on that. Explain it a bit more. What does it mean to have a large surface area? Like how do they have it? Now, as always, I like to finish off my lessons with a terminology a recap, and this is looking back at all the words we used today. Remember that if you are unable to do terminology and terminology sections, then you won't be able to do the rest of the harder questions, and you won't be getting full marks for your explanations. So use these words in the form of um, flashcards. It makes it really, really easy to learn from. Starting off with the nose, of course, this is the structure that we want to breathe with. It has lots of hairs, mucus to trap dust and foreign particles. Mucus is, of course, that protein and water mixture that we have everywhere in our nose, our throat, pharynx, larynx, all the way down to the trachea and lungs. Speaking of larynx and pharynx, remember the larynx is where you speak from. It's your voice box. It's where language comes from. It's your cartilaginous voice box. The pharynx is the back of the throat, more associated with swallowing and going down to the food or esophagus tube. We then had the trachea, which is your windpipe, but I don't like using that word, and so we don't want to use it in exams, please. Um, the trachea is surrounded by cartilage, which holds it open. Then getting down into the bigger structures, the pleura was that membrane that sits around your lungs like a bag. It protects your lungs against friction. The lungs themselves are divided into lobes, um, which are like regions. And then we had uh, the diaphragm, which is along with the intercostal muscles are the muscles that sit around your lungs and help you breathe. And then we zoomed into the very small structures, which are the bronchi. Now, the bronchi are the little tubes that come down from the trachea. So it sort of goes trachea, bronchi, then bronchioles, which are the smallest tubes. And then right at the end of each of those bronchioles, there's a teeny tiny little alveoli, which is the site of gaseous exchange. Now, if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and turn your notifications on so you know when I post new content every Tuesday and Thursday. And I will see you all again soon, grade 11s. Bye.